In this example, I am going to give a little more in-depth explanation of the torque model using uh, an example where we need to find something called the rotational, rotational inertia of an object, or moment of inertia. And basi basically, it's the rotational mass of an object. Uh, when things rotate, uh, there are a couple different factors that uh, dictate uh, how hard it is to rotate it or its inertia. So in this example, we'll take a look at that and learn how to calculate it. So uh, in this example, I'm going to have a wheel that's going to be mounted uh, on a stationary axis so it, it just rotates about this point and I'm going to hang a mass from it I'll call this uh, call this M1 and I'll call this M2 and I'm going to let M2 go and it's going to um, fall and there will be a linear acceleration of this object downward and there will be an angular acceleration of the uh, wheel and the goal here is to find I. What is the rotational inertia of this object? How can we quantify that? So, uh, again, this is basically a, a force model type problem, except it's a rotational force. But I'm going to go ahead and draw an FBD. In this example, I'm going to draw two FBDs, one of each object. Uh, so here's the, the wheel. And I have M1G for the wheel and then F of N, the force of the axle, the normal force that holds it up, and then I'm going to have T1. Very important here, I'm, or I'll just call it T, uh, but I call it tension, not M2G. Uh, as you'll see in a minute, uh, by simply labeling, labeling M2G, we're saying that the force is M2G, when in fact, if this thing rotates and the object falls down, M2 is M2G is not the force. Uh, for the second object, we have M2G and tension. So we're going to break it up uh, with two objects. Um, I'm going to sum the forces, and because there's a rotational aspect to this, I'm going to sum the torques. You can write sigma tau there. So in uh, in each case, I have no forces in the x direction, unless this is m1. I do have forces in the y direction. And I'm going to should label my positive axes here. And positive up here. Okay. So uh, in the for the wheel, I have Fn, which is pointing up. M1G points down and T1 points down. And there will be an angular acceleration, or excuse me, linear acceleration because it's locked into place. There will be no linear acceleration. But when I sum the torques, now because this object is going to rotate this direction, I'm going to denote the counterclockwise direction as positive. So this is for the top guy there. And this is going to equal I alpha, like we saw in the previous video. So there's only one force that can possibly cause a torque. These two act through the center, or the, the pivot point, the rotation point, so they can't cause a torque. They can't cause it to spin. This one is off-center by a distance r, the radius, I'll call that. So it can possibly cause a torque. So I'm going to say that this is r cross t. Capital T for tension, not torque. r cross t is the torque. Um, it will uh, accelerate angularly, so there is an angular acceleration. For this guy here, relatively simple, no x forces here. I should be clarified, this is m2. And there are uh, forces in the y direction, T minus M two G. And because this thing accelerates downwards, as we've seen before, I'm going to put a negative sign there. And there is an acceleration there, a negative one that points down. So, so far, what have we, what have we done? We've drawn a, an FBD of the wheel itself. We've drawn an FBD of the object that's falling. We've listed the forces, the force equations, and because the wheel can spin an additional torque equation, 
where we, for this particular problem, denoted counterclockwise as positive because that's the way it's going to rotate. If the mass had been over here, we could have said clockwise as positive. Uh, and for the falling mass, some of the forces next, some of the forces y. So business as usual for the most part here. So let's solve for i. A couple little uh, things here. So I'm going to bring the, the solution part up here. I'm going to take the first equation here doesn't really do too much for us. And this here is just a statement of uh, that the normal force must support the, the weight plus the tension. These two here, the torque equation and this y equation, actually do the work here. So I'm going to copy them up here. R cross T is equal to I alpha. And from the y equation here, T minus M2G uh, is equal to minus m 2 um, now, given everything here except I, I is the only unknown, so given the masses and accelerations and so forth, given everything but I, how do we solve for I? Uh, let's take, let's go very slowly here, so I'll call this step one here, step two, and we're, I'm going to uh, reduce this cross product, so in class you saw this is R cross T, which is RT times the sine of the angle between them. Let's take a look here. Here's the R vector. It's the vector that goes from the point of rotation to where the force is applied. So it's right there. If I extend this out, doo -doo 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 -doo, looks like we have a 90 degree angle there. The force vector and the radial vector, there's a 90 degree angle. The sine of 90 is simply plus one. So this is just a plus one. Meaning we're gonna get the maximum torque if we apply force at 90 degree angles. Anything that veers away from 90, we're gonna get something less than optimal. Um, I times alpha. Now here we have an alpha and here we have an A. So we have a variable that seems related to the other one, but they're not exactly the same variable. So I'm going to do a little side dish here, a little side note. And this goes back to geometry. And you don't need to write this down every time. This is just explain the concept. This goes back to arc length. So given a radius r here and theta here, this is s the arc length for this part of the circle, how far it travels. S is what they use in geometry class. I'm going to use the variable x. So for instance, if this was a wheel rolling on the ground, how far would it travel x along the ground? So we can say x is equal to r theta. And this is displacement. If I... Uh, take the derivative with respect to time, or just say the velocity, that's equal to r omega, the angular velocity, r being constant. And the linear acceleration, another derivative down, is r times alpha. So I can relate linear quantities, these guys here, to angular quantities here by simply this factor of r. So when I say alpha here, that's really a over r. And over here, I'm going to solve for this T here, M2G minus M2A. And so you can see here, the tension is not M2G. Because this object is falling down, the tension in the string is a little bit less than what it would be. How much is it less by? Well, it's M2 times acceleration rate. And in fact, if this acceleration rate were G, there'd be zero tension. So, the next step here, step three, I'm going to plug this tension right in there and solve for uh, I. So, R times M2G minus M2A equals I A over R. And I'm going to bring that R up and square it. So, I'll just say squared here and get rid of that guy. And then I is simply R squared M two G over A minus M two A over A. 
and I know it cancels here in a second, but I just want to show you something. Uh, and, well, in fact, I'll cancel it now. These don't cancel per se, but unit-wise they cancel. This is just a meter per second divided by meter per second. This is a meter per second divided by meter per second. So basically, at the end of the day, we have something that looks like a meter squared, because R is meters, times a kilogram, or more aptly put for in the physics world, kilogram meter squared. So what does this tell us? And if we had the numbers, you could plug them in and get an answer. But this tells us that rotational inertia depend on, obviously, the mass of the object. So the larger the object, the more rotational inertia it has. But also meters, or in this case, that came from the radius. The, the wider it is, or the larger the radius, the more the mass is spread out from the pivot point, the heavier rotational that it, it is. So um, you'll see in the book that basically all rotational inertias are of the form some constant, some number, times m r squared, kilograms meter squared. Uh, whether they be wheels, whether they be batons, or um, whatever it is that spins, they're always of the form m r squared. Depends on the mass of the object and where the mass is distributed, how far it is away from the pivot point. So, in a nutshell, uh, for this little more complex torque model, even though it's a little more complex, it basically follows the same idea. We draw FBDs, we send the forces and torques. Here we chose a direction that made some sense for us. Given those force and torque equations, don't forget this minus sign right here because it falls down. Given those force and torque equations, uh, we have a set of equations. In this uh, problem, I solved for I, assuming we knew everything else. I solved for I. And um, given the numbers, we could have get we could have gotten a numerical answer. But in, in this example, I wanted to show that basically all a rotational inertia is depend on the mass of an object and where the mass is distributed. And so you can use this model to um, in this example to solve any type of problem where there are one, two, three, or four masses hanging from an object that can rotate, and um, and the resulting uh, angular accelerations and rotational inertias.